Good morning. <clears throat> On the other side of this tape that we are doing this morning is the message given last week on Maui, Illumination Through Meditation. And the reason that this message is going on the second side of that tape is that I would like to carry further the subject that was started there. The spiritual path is a difficult one without any question. The Master warned about that when he said that the way is straight and narrow and few there be, few there be that enter. Indeed, very few. And we have no way of knowing whether he explained this to the disciples or not. He probably did. But the reason the spiritual path is difficult is that since what is called the fall of man, that is, since we entered material consciousness, or material consciousness entered us, our attention has been centered on the world out here. And we have been seeking for our pleasure and profit, for our satisfaction, happiness, safety, and security out here in what the Master called this world. From the earliest human days, dependence was placed on bows and arrows or slingshots. Swords, dynamite, gunpowder, walls. You all know of the great length and thickness of the wall of China. Walls, fortresses, barricades. all for protection and property, whether earned, stolen, won in war, property. So that over the centuries we have developed a consciousness seeking always in the external for something to supply our satisfactions, our safety, our security, our peace, our supply, and our health. And when you make the transition to the spiritual path, all of this has to be reversed. This is uh, what is called dying daily, being reborn, surrendering oneself to God, giving oneself to God, yielding oneself to God, or in Oriental teachings it's called non-attachment. Now all of this must not be misunderstood. In no wise does it mean that we do not eat food or require it. It does not imply that there is anything wrong with wealth or health. All of this spiritual path implies 
how these are attained. On the spiritual path, all attention is transferred from the visible to the invisible. And it is taught by the master in this way. I have meat the world knows not of, or I am the meat, the wine, the water, the resurrection. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I am come that ye might have life and that ye might have it more abundantly. Not the fortresses, not the bombs, not the storehouses of food, but the within, the inner self, the inner being, the inner substance of life. This is come that there may be an abundance in the outer, that there may be this protection, that there may be food and clothing and housing. Not, not as some believe that we ignore these or claim they are unnecessary or that we're too spiritual to think about them. All of this is nonsense. But rather that we understand that the source of good in our experience is within and that as we turn our attention to that withinness all the things are added unto us we are led to them or they are delivered to our doorstep the difficult part is in turning from the without to the within and their attaining contact with that source that does supply us with everything from our health, our longevity, our immortality to the food we eat and the clothes we wear and the housing that we require. All these become the added things after we have found our inner grace, contact. In World War II, I had the pleasure, the privilege, of working with, I cannot remember the number exactly, but it was in the 20s, 20-some children of students who found themselves in service. Now, each and every one of these came through without an injury or a death. Every one of them. And yet every one of them was in action. Every one of them was at the front somewhere. It isn't that those on the spiritual path do not participate in every human experience. They do. The master insisted, remain in the world. Don't leave it. Don't try to live your life in monasteries or convents or up in mountain tops or by seashores out of the world but remain in the world but be not of the world and he cautioned remain in this city until you are 
endued from on high. In other words, remain right where you are doing what you are doing until you find yourself ordained, until you can feel that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon you and that you can say with Paul, I live, yet not I. Christ, the Spirit of God within me, liveth my life. He performeth that which is given me to do. I can do all things through Christ which dwelleth in me. But until we come to that point of illumination, realization, we remain right where we are, doing the things that we are doing, fulfilling every obligation, and preparing ourselves in our particular work in the infinite way, we have adopted meditation as the way to illumination. With us, meditation is not just something on the side. Meditation is not just something that you do to feel peaceful within. With us, meditation is the way. It is uh, the mode, the means, which we use to attain the inner contact we have a purpose in meditation. We have an object. We have a goal. Meditation isn't that goal. Meditation is the way. The goal is realization, illumination. And what this really means, whether you say realization or whether you say illumination, what you really mean is actual God contact actual God experience. In our work, the intellectual knowledge of books and principles is also not a major factor, but a minor factor. It is another of our ways. When uh, we learn the specific principles that operate in our message. It is not because we believe that learning them will accomplish anything of itself, but rather that working with these principles, we eventually open our soul center. We awaken that sleeping giant within us. We make contact with our source. Now, <clears throat> you will notice, for instance, that in our spiritual healing work, we do not pray to God ever for healings. We never ask God to heal anyone. We don't even believe that God can. That's not part of our work in any faith. Our work is based on certain principles that have been revealed to me in connection with a long, long time of spiritual healing work. And the major principle is this, that God knows nothing about sin, disease, death, lack, or limitation, and that there never has been a God to do anything about these.
that all of the sin and the disease and the false appetites and the lack and the limitation and all of the deaths that have ever taken place in the history of the world have only taken place in the mind of man. And all because of a universal belief in two powers. The belief that there is a power of evil. In other words, a denial. All sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation is a denial of God's omnipotence. Who would ever dream that there is an omnipotence and then another power? You might as well tear up your dictionaries and a good part of the Bible. Oh, I know there is lots of authority in the Bible for believing in two powers. The reason is that the law given by Moses has been construed in religious circles as being a law of God, whereas it never was. Where you have in the Hebrew teachings, that is the Old Testament teachings, which now comprise the Christian teaching, where you have such teachings, you have a reversion to the belief that God is both good and evil, that God gives good and gives evil, that God is responsible for life and God is responsible for death, that God is responsible for victories in war and God is responsible for defeats in war. Or as the member of one political party said recently, we are sure that God is on our side. Strange how the other side has won so many elections. You see, lip service to omnipotence is not really the realization of the meaning of omnipotence. Even even the affirmation of God's omnipotence isn't a power. Power lies only in realization, illumination. Whereas before I was blind, now I see. Whereas I may for years declare God's omnipotence, God's omniscience, Yes, think for a moment. Omniscience, all knowledge, all wisdom, and then count up how many prayers are being uttered today in which God is being told what we need or what this country needs or some other country or some families, all of which is a denial of omniscience. Do you see the difficulty on the spiritual path when you have to sit down in prayer, not only and almost cut your tongue out so that it doesn't tell God something or ask something of God, but you almost have to tear your mind out to keep it from thinking thoughts of uh, trying to gain God's power. Of course it's difficult. It is difficult to close the eyes and realize that since God is the infinite wisdom that created and maintains the universe, God the all-knowing, there is no need of my acquainting God with my needs, with informing God of your needs. I must sit firm in the faith of omniscience, God the all-knowing. Since 
I cannot accept any God except omnipotence. Certainly I cannot ask God to be a power over some other non-existing power even though I may believe in another power. I may temporarily succumb to the belief that there is a power of sin, temptation, disease, lack, fear. But if I am to pray, there must certainly be the recognition I am not asking a God power. I am acknowledging omnipotence. That is, that there is no other power. Therefore, I'm not seeking any God power. And if I am to be logical, I must conclude with omnipresence. If there is such a thing as omnipresence, and what else could God be if not omnipresence? How could there be a God absent from someplace? God must be omnipresence. Then just think that here, present where I am, the very place whereon I stand, right here must be this omnipresence, which is also all-knowing omniscience, all-powerful omnipotence. What more can I ask? Therefore, my prayer my contemplation must be a rehearsal within myself of the nature of God as omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. And because this is really not prayer, this is only a preparation for prayer, I must then come to the point of prayer. That is, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. I am listening for thy voice. Not I will, I am listening for thy voice. I am receptive and responsive to thy will. I am receptive and responsive to thy grace. And then comes the stillness, the quietness, the listening attitude, followed by an inner peace, the descent of the Holy Ghost, the ordination, the realization that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and I am ordained. And now that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, this, this is my bread. This is my meat, my wine, my water. This is the word of God that has been given to me by which I live, by which I have life eternal. And so, prayer, treatment, contemplation, meditation, this is a way to lead us into an inner stillness, an inner quietness, into an altitude and an attitude of receptivity so that we may feel the presence of the Lord God upon us. And then realize, now the presence goes before me to make the crooked places straight. Now the Word of God is the substance of all form, the substance of my daily life. So that our prayer or meditation actually becomes the experience of God. You can prepare for this through the activity of the mind in what we call contemplative meditation as we are now experiencing it here and now. But remember, 
that the actual God experience comes only after whatever words or thoughts have entered your period of contemplation and meditation, after these words and thoughts have come to an end and you have attained stillness even if only for 10, 20, 30 seconds, Now, as we continue this practice daily and as many times a day as possible, we find that eventually this inner peace does settle upon us, that a contact with our source is made, not through the mind, but through our awakened soul faculties or spiritual discernment. And then we find that it becomes literally true. Emmanuel or God with us. Then it becomes literally true that the presence of God is with us, before us, behind us, and beside us. That we are living in and through an invisible, incorporeal, transcendental presence about which we have heard a lot about which we have spoken a lot, but now which we experience. Now it becomes that in which and through which and by which we live. It becomes the reality of our experience. Nothing less than this constitutes the infinite way. Nothing less than this constitutes infinite way healing. When you bring omniscience, omnipotence and omnipresence into your life as a living experience, you learn why the master said, take no thought for your life. There isn't any need to take thought. God is imparting all that is necessary in the way of thought and deed. This is understood better when you begin to grasp the nature of spiritual power. Now remember that until the infinite way, spiritual power has been accepted as something that can be used. No one has ever used spiritual power and no one ever can use spiritual power, for that one would make that would make one superior to spiritual power. For spiritual power to function, there must be a complete absence of human power. There must be the complete recognition of the master I can of my own self do nothing. If I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. There must be that complete acceptance of this so that spiritual power can use us. Spiritual power can function through us. We cannot use it. We cannot manipulate it. We cannot direct it toward anyone, to anyone, for anyone. We can only be the transparencies through which spiritual power can flow to this world. There's no room in, uh, on the spiritual path for ego. There is no room for spiritual greatness on the part of anyone 
For there isn't anyone spiritually great. There is but one good, the Father in heaven. Why callest thou me good? Why callest thou me spiritual? Why callest thou me anything? When all that I can be is a transparency through which God's grace reaches human consciousness. And this can only be in proportion to my acceptance of God as omniscience, the all-knowing, so that I do not ever try to annoy God with my thoughts, my beliefs, my wishes, my desires, my hopes, until I can accept God as omnipotence, not as a power that overcomes sin or disease or lack, but as all power in the presence of which there is no sin, disease, death, or lack. And omnipresence, the acceptance of the revelation that if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I make my bed in heaven, thou art there. If I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art there. Because of omnipresence. This means overcoming the religious superstition that if you have sinned, God has all of a sudden taken himself away from you. And this is ignorance and superstition. Because no one has ever yet committed a sin so great as to separate himself from God. Any sinner, the most scarlet of sinners, like the woman taken in adultery, the thief on the cross, and anybody in between, can at any moment close their eyes and recognize omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence. Even on the cross, the thief can say, O Master, and find himself taken into heaven. Even at the moment of being stoned to death, the woman taken in adultery can just look up and behold the Christ and be saved. That is why the spiritual path is difficult. There are all of these superstitions to overcome. All of this ignorance of the nature of God to be overcome. All of this ignorance of the nature of prayer to be overcome. Until we can close our eyes to the outside world, enter the inner sanctuary of our being and realize, here I am, Father, I and my Father, here together, one. The Father within and the Son without. One. Here where I am, in my sin, in my disease, in my death, in my lack. Here I and the Father are one. And the realization of this oneness operates in consciousness to remove the barriers to realization and demonstration. Not the demonstration of supply, not the demonstration of companionship, not the demonstration of a home. This is more ignorance and superstition. There is only one demonstration, and that is the demonstration of the presence of God. And anyone seeking any other demonstration is delaying their spiritual progress and their physical, mental, moral, and financial harmony. Anyone who is seeking the demonstration of anything other than the realized presence is wasting time, their own time, valuable time in their own lives. Do not misunderstand. There is the mental realm. And on that mental realm, it is possible to demonstrate health, supply, home, anything one wants in the human picture. There's no guarantee of its permanence, and there's no guarantee that it will be a blessing. The 
somebody once accepted the belief that it was just as easy to demonstrate a Cadillac as it was a Ford, and they proved that that was so. And then they couldn't afford the price of the upkeep. Yes, it's just as easy to demonstrate a Cadillac as a Ford, but there are lots of times you'll have to ask, what will you do with it after you have it? And not only in transportation, you'd be surprised how many things we would love to demonstrate that if we demonstrated them, we'd find afterward what a burden they would be. But in demonstrating, God's grace here where I am, I leave it in the realm of God's wisdom to know what things I have need of and to supply them. I like those passages in Scripture. I know not how to pray. I know not how to go out or how to come in. But let the Spirit of God bear witness with my spirit, and I'm satisfied. Then the things that are added unto me, first place, come to me without causing loss to someone else. Very often provide as much blessing to others as to me. And I need never question whether anything is good for me. If it has come as the grace of God, it is good, it is necessary, it is God's fulfillment within me. Illumination, then, really means the experience of God, the experience of the Christ, the experience of omnipresence, the experience of divine grace. All of this is illumination. There are times when illumination brings with it some visions and messages, but most of what has been given to the religious world as illumination really consists of neuroses, neurotics, the mentally unstable and unstable. That is why in many, many, many of the books containing stories of religious mystics, you will find that most of them are mental misfits, and most of the visions they had were epileptic in nature. Why? Because the grace of God is not something of an abnormal nature. The grace of God is not something of an unnecessary nature or nature without significance, but rather the grace of God is for the fulfillment of God's man on earth. The grace of God results in constructive principles, modes of life. Well, shall we go any further than the Master and see that the grace of God that was upon him resulted not in stupid visions, but in the healing of the sick, the forgiving of the sinner, the raising of the dead, the destroying of false appetites, and a code of life whereby we might live. A code of life. All, every part of the Master's revelation is practical. Not one part of it is that of an idle dreamer. A dreamer, yes, but not an idle dreamer. Every dream of the Masters was a practical dream and resulted in practical demonstration. Life harmonious on earth 
as it is in heaven. It is natural that meditation will bring with it messages at times. Be careful that you're not looking for them because you might induce them mentally and then believe that it is spiritual. Don't look for them. Look only for the unknown, God's grace. And since you do not know what God's grace is or what form it takes, you're safe. The same as in meditating for the grace of, for the presence of God, since it is utterly impossible for your mind to grasp God, just remember that if you have any thoughts or ideas of what God is or how God will appear, you are making graven images in your mind and then expecting miracles of them as the Hebrews expected miracles of the golden calf. A golden calf cannot perform miracles. Not even uh, the golden coins in Fort Knox in which so many people had so much faith and are wondering what to do now. When you meditate, leave the result in the hands of God. Leave it with God. to function in God's way. If by chance it brings a direct message, be thankful. If it brings some vision, be thankful. If it brings a principle of life, be thankful. But don't go back into tomorrow's meditation looking for the same experience because it may come in an entirely different way. And as a matter of fact, if my own experience is any criterion, most of the time, it comes only with an inner feeling of quiet and nothing more. When necessary, be assured, definite orders come, definite instructions, definite messages, definite principles. In fact, all of the principles taught in the infinite way came in meditation. What this all adds up to is this. Once you attain the experience, once you attain this inner con contact, the realization of the presence, you will discover why the Master said, take no thought for your life that these things are added unto you, then you will discover that the attitude toward life should always be receptivity, a, a, a listening attitude, morning, noon, and night, and especially upon retiring, because very often when we are asleep and the human will is not active, human desire, human hope, then the very grace of God has a greater opportunity of entering our consciousness and performing its work. It is for this reason that the last few moments before sleep are so important. Opening of consciousness to the receptivity of God. Just imagine that since God governs the day, God also governs the night. 
But it is more natural to think that because you are awake during the day that you are more receptive to God's government, and that should not be so. There should not be a split second of your experience in which you are not receptive, alert. I have never forgotten the experience when in going through a period of temporary lack I discovered that I needed a hundred dollars but I had a hundred and fifty dollars outstanding and the first temptation was oh well all is well it's all right and then the realization that came oh because you have fifty dollars more than you need you don't need God everything's all right you have more than you need now you see we in our periods of health and sufficiency we also are very apt unconsciously of course it's never a conscious act but unconsciously we are apt to assume that all is well we're physically well and we have a sufficiency of supply and we're as happy as can humanly be expected at home so uh, all is well but it really isn't well unless we are at the same time constantly attuned to the spirit for its government for its word by which we live, for the realization of its presence within us, then all is well. And then all is well, even if at the moment we seem to be as Elijah was out in the wilderness without food and without a following, without patience and without students, without a congregation. But all was well as he heard when he tuned in, I have saved out a remnant of 7,000. And in addition to that, when he was hungry, he was fed, whether it was by birds or whether it was by a poor widow made no difference, or whether the cakes were baked on the coals before him. Nevertheless, he was fed. All was well in spite of appearances. To the contrary. So with us, whether in our periods of seeming barrenness in any department of our lives, or whether in the period of affluence, mental, physical, moral, financial affluence, nevertheless all is not well unless we are attuned and receiving the assurance from within, I am on the field, fear not. I am with thee. I will be with thee unto the end of the world. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant, so go right ahead living. That is why in our spiritual lives, the moments of greatest temptation are the moments when we may be led to take God's presence for granted instead of continuing to attune and attune and attune for assurance and reassurance and reassurance. Illumination reveals always that spiritual power 
is omnipresent in the moment that we are absent from the body, absent from thought, in the moment that ye think not the bridegroom cometh, and that God's power is the source, the substance, the activity of our daily experience. And it is for this reason that the true sense of humility can develop so that it isn't that you think you can do nothing, but that you know you can do all things through Christ. That you know you can do nothing without the conscious recognition and realization of the presence. In the same way that we have been carrying the metaphysical teaching of uh, there is no power in error, one step further. There is power in error. There is power in the world belief. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the kind of a world we have today. But the full truth is that there is no power to any form of error, evil, discord, in the presence of the Christ, in the presence of illumined consciousness. If error in and of itself were not power, it would just disappear wherever it may seem to be. But it only disappears when it touches illumined consciousness, when it touches the individual who has received spiritual grace, realization, illumination. And it is for this reason, when you have any form of error to meet, to face, be sure that after you have made your statements of truth or affirmations of truth, as the case may be, that you do not rely on these, but rather settle down into this inner peace until you do feel that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon you, and then you can know no weapon that is formed against thee can prosper. No weapon that is formed against thee can prosper when you are in the presence of that divine grace, when you are in the presence of that inner spiritual assurance. A thousand shall fall at thy left and ten thousand at thy right. Do you see the significance of that? Not that error isn't power. It is power to the thousand at thy left and ten thousand at thy right. It is not power unto thee. Ah, who is the thee? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Unto he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, none of these evils will come nigh thy dwelling place. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And going from the Old Testament to the New, you have it confirmed by the Master in the 15th chapter of John. If you abide in my word, if you let me abide in you, this presence, you will bear fruit richly. But if you do not abide in the word, if you do not let me abide in you, if you do not abide in the realization of this presence, you will be as a branch of a tree that is cut off and withers and dies. Ah, yes, the spiritual path is an iffy path. If you abide in the secret place of the Most High, if you live in the constant realization of this indwelling presence. If you dwell in this inner experience of God, the realized Christ or Son of God, if you do these things, none of the evils of this world will come nigh thy dwelling place. You say, but it comes nigh my relatives. Yes, it comes nigh their dwelling place. Dwelling place doesn't mean a residence. 
means your consciousness, where you live, not where your relatives live, where you live. Of course, Scripture also says, two shall lie in bed together and one be taken and one be left. Why? We are individuals and uh, we progress spiritually individually. We may unite for the purpose of study and meditation, but we cannot unite to enter heaven. We cannot unite to enter God. That is an individual experience of your consciousness and mind. If you dwell in the secret place, these evils will not come nigh thy dwelling place, but it doesn't say, it does not say anything about the person sitting next to you or dwelling in the same residence with you, except that a thousand of them may fall at your left and ten thousand at your right. The spiritual life is an individual experience. The woman taken in adultery was freed, but she didn't free all adulteresses. The thief on the cross was freed, but he didn't free all thieves. Life is an individual experience as you are discovering. And the secret is I and my father are one, but this truth does not operate until it has been realized within my consciousness. It is true that I and my father are one. It is true that you and your father are one, but do not expect any fruitage from that relationship until the experience has become yours. Then, then the fruitage appears richly. I and my Father are one, all that the Father hath is mine. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. And in the degree of my realization of this, so is it unto me and unto thee. Thank you.